Hi. Sorry about the wait. So um, today I'm here to talk to you guys about how we develop games and more specifically how we develop the characters in our games. So concepting iconic characters for games, uh, animation, and film. So everyone here knows what an iconic concept for a character is. These designs leave an impression on us. All of these are testaments to how greatly they're put together. So today we're just going to do a bit of a deep dive on how these uh, character designs are put together and what it takes to create an iconic character design. So let's look at what it takes to create an iconic character, how do we approach creating an iconic character, and last but not least, what's, more, what's the most important aspect of creating an iconic character. So what makes a great iconic character design? So iconic character designs are a good representation of their story, first and foremost. Secondly, they communicate through societal boundaries. And then last but not least, they're incredibly relatable. So we'll be looking at what each of these mean and then also take a look at examples that further give us a better idea of how this is used in the media we consume today. So iconic character designs are a good representation of their story. And what this means is that as the story evolves, the, the design that the designers put together evolves with it. Basically, a design that doesn't need any sort of translation is a successful one. So you guys might know who this character is. Uh, this is Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings series. Um, this might be a bit of a spoiler alert, but uh, as the story continues in the Lord of the Rings series, we get to figure out this mystical world. But before anything happens in the books and in the movie, we see this old guy who just comes up on screen and the elements that he actually is wearing and the elements that he has are actually very basic. For instance, we look at this old man and he has an old hat, he has incredibly saggy kind of uh, tattered clothing. Uh, Gandalf has a walking stick which helps him get through the world. He drives an old cart and one of the first scenes in the movies is him actually bumping his head. So from first glance, this character is no different than my grandfather. So I mentioned that as the story continues, this isn't the case though. Gandalf is thrown into this huge quest. He's entrusted with safeguarding a group of travelers who take a mysterious ring to a mountain of doom, you know, the typical story. But what happens is during this call to adventure, the elements that we're familiar with completely change. Gandalf as a character changes with them. So once we move from the Shire, the location in which the hobbits live, to the rest of the world, Gandalf too becomes more of a mystical character. He becomes more powerful. His beard shows wisdom instead of age. Uh, the color of his robes change from white to show that he isn't wearing tattered old clothes, he isn't an old man. He's a figure of power and of uh, great trust from the characters around him. And last but not least, his walking stick, that very typical thing that we saw all throughout the beginning of the film, is now a symbol of his power. It's filled with magic. This is a really good example of how a character can be portrayed as one thing in, its, in their design, but the same elements could mean something completely different at the end of a story. So Gandalf is an incredibly good character that is iconic due to his relatability and progression with the story. So 
Tolkien, the writer of the Lord of the Rings series, was originally inspired by the leftmost drawing over there. It was a postcard. In it, you see an old man feeding uh, a, a deer. And he liked how serene and how calming this character was. Now, him being, like any of us concept designers, he knew that Gandalf as a character is going to be incredibly impressive and grander than life. But he purposely chose this very down-to-earth uh, skinning for the character because he wanted that arc, that progression, to be that much more impactful. So why is it important for our characters to be a good uh, representation of their story? Well, knowing your story will give the audience or the gamers a better idea and you will provide them a more educated design, one that progresses from start to finish. So in addition to that, we have to remember we're designing for games that cater to gamers from a wide variety of different cultures. If the core design consists of a simple idea, then any type of research and any type of specific, ty specific development work that we do as concept de designers will further that specific goal. So what does this mean? So here's a character that I'm sure you all know. Uh, the question is, why does Darth Vader scare children? Darth Vader gives us that feeling of being a bad guy from the first moment we see him. Why do we feel that way? He hasn't done anything wrong, he barely speaks, and he just stands there. If anything, he could be seen as some weird statuesque character uh, maybe he's a commanding officer, but he doesn't really seem evil. So the amazing thing about this design is that even without seeing his true face, without seeing his violent nature, without even hearing him speak, you already know that he's a bad guy. So looking at the con conception phase of this character, we get to know a little bit more about what's under the hood. Looking at these early illustrations by Ralph McQuarrie, we can see that there's a lot going on that isn't first seen at, and appreciated at face value. McQuarrie uses predatory features on the character's uh, design in order to give us a lot of the, that emotional uh, feeling that we get when we first see Darth Vader. The sketches on the right, actually, are taking inspiration from very predatory animals. They have bat-like eyes. They have this visor that points the character forward. This character doesn't have good facial maneuverability. He's always looking ahead. This is a strategic thing that's embodied into this design because that's what predators do. Looking at the illustration on the left, you see his cape. It's taking reference from bat wings. Very sinister type of references are made here simply for that reason. Another point that we need to acknowledge is the lack of human recognizability. When you see Darth Vader, your first impression of him isn't that he's a person. Your first impression is that he's a statue, or a robot, um, some type of weird character that isn't human, maybe an alien, but this is done on purpose. And the reason for this is when we can't see a character's face, it is very hard to empathize with them. It is very hard to emote with them. And it is very difficult to, to tell what they're emoting. And when you don't know what that character is doing, it makes you feel very uneasy. And this, so this is all done on purpose. So McCory's success with this design teaches us one thing, and that's to effectively communicate a soul design you have to have your objective in mind. Anything like the animalistic research, the focus on the visor and the helmet, the lack of human recognition here, all of that is supplemental in addition to the goal to make this character sinister. And so this is why this character transcends cultural boundaries. If I were to show this design in the West or in the East, 
show them to a person who has never heard about Star Wars. Immediately they will be frightened and pinpoint that this character is a villain. And so that's one of the key elements that we can take away from this. Moving on. One of the more important tools in creating iconic character design is the ability to use and project a lot of yourself into your work. And this is a technique that I often use. We often create visual solutions, but the more important element of that is to take aspects of yourself, your own fears, your goals, your ambitions, um, your personal experiences, and then Im imbued them into the characters that you're creating. What this does is, the more you add into your character from yourself or from direct real life experiences, the easier it will be to draw out a personal connection from the end user. My, my life experiences aren't singularly my own. There's a lot of crossover between me as the content creator and the people that consume the content that I create. So what better way to create a bridge between my work and them than to put aspects of my life into the characters so that they can relate to them. So for those of you who don't know, this is Violet from The Incredibles. Uh, what's interesting about Violet is she has superpowers and is a simple teenager who goes to high school. And the ironic thing is she has a lot of powers that both Gandalf and Darth Vader have. She can control things with her mind. She can telekinetically create force fields. It's very interesting. Um, but unlike those two other characters, she is a character that is unsure of herself. She's self-defeating. She's vulnerable. She's a character who prefers solitude instead of human interaction. So why look at this character? This is definitely not the most well-known. So one of the reasons why I wanted to take a look at this character and connect it, her with relatability is because looking at these illustrations, the visual translation for her personality are expressed through a number of very intelligent design choices. Now, all these design choices are not an accident. Her outfit, looking at the drawing from the, le the second to the left, shows that she wears baggy clothes. Maybe she's self-conscious of her body like many teenagers in high school are. If we look at the fourth drawing from the left, we see that she's wearing a more form-fitting superhero outfit and she's even more at unease. We look at her hair. She is literally hiding behind parts of her body so that she doesn't get to see a lot of the world and so that people can't see her. These are all conscious things that are put into this design so that we can be more, uh, we can relate clearly to the character at the end of the film. So how did the designers do this? A lot of it has to do with them looking at their own life experiences, their personal, ex uh, their, their friends and family's life experiences, and taking all those experiences and putting them into Violet. As I mentioned before, all of this effort goes into us connecting with this character. And so using relatability in your designs is an incredibly powerful tool for you to immediately win over your viewer. So now how do we approach implementing these things that we're talking about in creating an iconic character design? Now that we've discussed these three qualities, we should acknowledge that in a day-to-day uh, job, you're not always designing a Gandalf, a Darth Vader, or a Violet. You're designing, you know, a random NPC. You're designing a random background character. But you might be also designing the main character of the game. So what are the best tools to implement for all of those different types of challenges that you undertake on a day-to-day -day basis? So I prepared a quick piece for us to take a look at and just generally go through. Um, so here's a character that I just quickly put together. 
we'll briefly look through the principles we talked over. And in this piece, I purposely picked a character that uh, has the demeanor of a very stoic, very wise and noble character. But making it interesting, I put it in a character that has a very small stature. So this character is about the height of Gimli. He's a dwarf. And so having this type of duality, this combination of stature but physically small, this give and take, Violet is very powerful, but she's shy. Darth Vader is incredibly uh, foreboding, but we never see his face. Having this type of duality is very important. So keeping in mind, and moving ahead with this character, I ask myself a lot of questions while I'm concepting. I want to make sure that this character is a good embodiment of the story that goes with it. Oftentimes, I'm not given a brief on a character, or the brief is very loose. So what are some story elements I can add to this character that will later on be drawn from and implemented into the game? So in this case, I wanted this character to be battle-hardened. He isn't somebody sitting on a throne with pristine armor, never seen the light of day, just staying there. He's a character that is actively in wars. He's battle-hardened. And so taking time to add wear and tear to his armor, paying attention to the fact that his armor is utilitarian and not stylish. A lot of times we see in fantasy armor very wispy, very fluid design that is not very practical. So keeping that in mind, I wanted this character to have a more utilitarian feel. And so th for that reason, the character has all this bulk on his upper body and lower body. So all these conscious decisions help add this story even before there exists a story. I mean, there's no script attached to this character. There's no game attached to this character. So how can this character have a story? Well, we add the story into the character because oftentimes you won't be given the life history of the shopkeeper in your game. It is up to you as a designer to add in, you know, details. Is the shopkeeper, um, has, does he get into fistfights because he's a bar owner? Maybe you should include some scars. Was he a war veteran? Maybe he should include, uh, maybe you should include some type of historic uh, clothing or some type of specific uh, uh, wounds in order to uh, communicate those types of details. So keeping those things in mind makes your design more informed. Moving ahead, to make this design communicate through societal boundaries is pretty tough. We don't have a four movie franchise showing you how this character is iconic. But what we do have is we can see the concept and as a viewer as a, and as a concept designer, you have to know where the viewer uh, looks first. So looking at this character's face, you can relate to what his background is. So, what is this character's background? Looking at his face, he looks like an authoritative figure. He looks like a stoic individual. He could be a father, or he could be uh, uh, an angry uncle, you know? You can draw sources of inspiration and create that relatability so that people, when they look at your concepts, have something to draw out from. If you just design for the sake of designing, all you're doing is regurgitating the things that you've seen and then just putting your own spin on it. But if you put aspects of yourself into your work and of the things you've seen, it creates for a more, more clear, more in-depth design. So by keeping these p three pieces of criteria in mind, by ensuring that your character has a good depiction of the story you're telling by keeping in mind that the character should be crossing societal boundaries and should be relatable, what you're doing is you're creating more thought out design and ultimately helping the rest of production put more weight on what you're creating. 
So while on the concept phase, we might not get all this information out, you're enabling animation, you're enabling the 3D model team, you're enabling the environment artist team to look at this character concept and draw sources of inspiration and further add to the story that doesn't exist yet. The narrative team could actually look at this and further uh, develop the backstory of a character. And this is actually quite common practice. So then, why should we care about iconic character design? Isn't it easier just to read a brief and do what the brief says? So, as character concept designers, we are facilitating the development of a game. Our goal is to further the happiness and the fulfillment of our end users. What better way to do that than to create characters that are loved, they're so beloved that people dress up as them, and they form a connection, generationally actually. So these people carry this connection through this time. So designing is actually a responsibility that we have in order to ensure that people actually connect with our products. It's an important tool. You see it in marketing every day. When you see a marketing piece for a AAA game out, out now, what do you see first? Do you see a piece of uh, environment, a prop? Most likely you're gonna see a character. And so that character had to originate from somewhere. So we have to be mindful of that. So how essential is iconic design in gaming today? So originally, a major emphasis in games was gameplay. Pac-Man, Pong, Asteroids, all these games required innovation in gameplay. And while innovation is incredible, Gamers today are looking to connect on a more sophisticated level. And technology is partly, you know, to, as a result of this. As technology develops, we're given the tools to fully realize some of these ideas we have. So our goal as concept designers is to create complex characters that emote and are able to deliver a performance. By doing this, we can enable audiences to further connect with our creations. So looking back, what we've established is that when designing a character, you have to understand the type of story that this character represents. You have to know what type of audience is gonna be looking at your character, and you have to leave room for people of different cultures and backgrounds to have that accessibility to understand your design. Most importantly, a design isn't worthwhile unless it has parts of you in it. So adding in that relatability is incredibly important. Having your background information, your heritage, your culture, your fears, your goals, all these things further enrich our characters. So adding them in is incredibly uh, gratifying for you as a creator, but incredibly enriching for the final gamers who get to experience what you do. So using this analysis on your day-to-day -day job will let you kind of create this loose checklist in order to give you the opportunity to create these informed decisions. So thank you for your time.